I've ever met. So I'm one of the docs in the well health system. Mr. Dr. Ben, we see on, you're not the Dr. Ben we see on the no, panel. That's not about I was going to say, you grew some hair. He's prettier, <laughs> but I'm, I'm taller and have more hair. <laughs> okay, I'm, I was confused there for a minute. No, it's on my bucket list. No, I've never done that. And by the way, too, as a disclaimer, my wife is pregnant and kind of do any day now. Wow. So I might check my watch and run out the back door. We know why. I'm not being rude. So yeah, so we want to talk about uh, advanced nutrition. That's kind of why you guys are here. Um, and just kind of, before we get into nutrition, I wanted to give a little bit of a, sort of a lay of the land of where we're at, a state of the union in terms of health. I guess if that's okay with you guys. So sure. I'm, a, I'm a big believer that in order to fix something, you have to face it. You got to know what you're up against. Uh, uh, you know, you got to live in reality, right? So if you want to fix your marriage, you got to face the reality of your marriage. If you want to fix your body, you got to face it. So same thing with our, our, our healthcare system. We spend about four trillion dollars per year on sickness. They call it healthcare, but it's really it's really sickness, right? It's almost four trillion dollars. Which before we started talking about 1.9 trillion dollar packages, that that seemed like a, a tremendous amount of money. Now it kind of seems like it's not that much, but it is an enormous amount of money. It's twelve thousand dollars per person per year on sickness. That's every man, woman, and child in the U.S. So it's an inordinate amount of money. And it would be one thing if we spent all that money and we got amazing health results and amazing outcomes. But where do you think the U.S. ranks on the list of the of the healthy nations? Yeah, we're right at the bottom. Out of the top 36, we're either 36 or 34 or 33, depending on how they manipulate the data. So we're the sickest country. We spend the most money on health care, and we're the sickest country on the, on the planet. So um, the highest rates of diabetes. By the way, with diabetes, um, remember what they used to call it 20 years ago? It used to be like the two types. It yeah. used to be called juvenile and adult mm -hmm. onset mm -hmm. diabetes. Yeah. Well, they don't call it that anymore because we have kids developing adult onset diabetes. So we're actually renaming diseases because we're so sick. We have the highest rates of cancer, we have the highest rates of heart disease, and obesity, and allergies, and autoimmune disorders, and arthritis, and ADHD, and asthma. I mean, you, you name it, we have more of it here than anywhere else. And those are just the A's, right? Yeah. Um, and COVID, that's a, I don't want to spend a lot of time on COVID, but I think it serves to spend a minute on it. There was a brilliant question, I don't know if you guys caught it, in the vice presidential debate. The moderator asked an amazing question, which, of course, neither candidate answered because they just like to vomit all over each other. But she asked, why has the U.S. been hit so much harder than other industrialized nations when it comes to COVID? Which I thought was a great question. Um, but the answer is because we're so sick. We're the sickest population on the planet. So if you introduce a virus into our sick population, we're going to be hit harder than other industrialized nations. It's really just that simple. And when it comes to COVID, I've been asked a lot, especially lately, like, are you going to get the vaccine? That's, that seems to be the most common question I get nowadays. And the answer is absolutely not. No. And, absolutely and there's some not. thinking underneath that. It's not just you know a knee-jerk reaction, but number one, I don't want to be part of a of a worldwide experiment mm -hmm. using a biologic, an experimental biologic gene transfer drug, okay. which is not a vaccine, it's a gene transfer drug which code causes our body to, tricks our body to code for proteins. So I don't want to be part of that. And number two is, um, it's not been shown to prevent transmission or infection. Okay. So the reality is, you can get the vaccine, you can still transmit, you can still get infected, but it does reduce the severity and self symptoms in some people, we think. So that seems to be, which really does it make sense to do that? If you're sick and you're suppressing the symptoms because you have the vaccine, you're going to go out and spread and be around versus staying at home and recovering. So it may have a counterintuitive effect. And one of the little dirty secrets that they don't tell you about it is it's harvested from a cell line called HEK293, which is human embryonic kidney tissue. So it's from aborted fetal tissue that was harvested back in the 1970s. And that's how they make the growth medium, those little cellular factories that make more of the virus, actually comes from an aborted baby from the 1970s. So as a believer in the Christian, I don't condone the use of aborted babies in medical research, much less something I'm going to inject into my own body. But you guys have to make your own decisions. I mean, sadly, and I don't like this, we have to be educated. We have to make our own decisions. We can't, don't take my word for it. Don't take Dr. Fauci's word for it. 
Mm. Certainly don't take Bill Gates' word for it. No you know, We have to make our own decisions. We have to do our own research. And I don't like that fact. I wish I could just leave it to the experts and just follow the guidelines and do what they tell us. But sadly, they get the guidelines wrong. They move the goalposts. The data is all over the place. So we have to make our own decisions. And the other reason I'm not getting the vaccine is because we make better health care decisions. In our household, we take ownership of our health. And we know that if your health improves, for instance, your vitamin D level. There was a study done out of Indonesia that showed that 94% of the deaths from COVID were in, people, were in people that had severely low vitamin D levels. Mm -hmm. That's such a simple, easy thing to raise our vitamin D level. We know that sugar, a lot of the nutritional principles we talk about are all related to that. So I think here's how we have to view health. It's not a matter of are you healthy or are you sick? It's where are you at on the continuum? So at 10, we have amazing, full function, optimal health, your potential would be at 10. And then at one, we have terrible health, awful health, sickness, disease, early death. What's zero? Death, Death right, so we're all, we're all familiar with the scale. So let's say, you're at a, let's say you're at a six. What's the only way to move toward better health? Change. You gotta yeah, move toward 10. Which does that, drugs or surgery? Neither. Right, and that's the problem. The reason we're so sick, a huge part of that, is because we, we exist in a healthcare system that literally has two tools. They have drugs and surgery. It's kind of like the fire department. They have axes and water hoses, right? So if, you're, if, you, if you have a fire in your house, who do you call? Fire, fire department, fire. right? And if you call them on time and they come and they do a good job, they'll, they'll kick down your front door, bash out your windows, and spray down all your, all your furniture and belongings. But if they get there and do a good job and you call them early enough, can they save the life of your house? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And should you be grateful for that? Yeah. Eternally. The question is, what's left when they're gone? It's a mess. Mm -hmm. And what, how logical would it be to call the fire department in the next day to restore the life of your house, to remodel and rebuild and prevent future fires? Or do you need a different specialist with different tools and different strategies in order to get your body or get your house back to health? And that's the problem, is we literally treat our health and our body with an emergency crisis care system, which is, which is quite frankly fatal. And that's, that's not really an argument. And um, trust me, medicine is amazing for what it does well. If my future child has a health problem, my wife has an issue with the pregnancy, if I have a heart attack while I'm standing up here, don't give me an adjustment. I don't need juice, I don't need omega threes. Take me to the healthcare system, right? So for crisis and emergency care, they do a phenomenal job. But for chronic disease and for obesity and diabetes, for the things that we really worry about, the, the system is, is broken. Here's the question. Why do we choose the donut over the apple? Raise your hand if you know that apples are better for you than donuts, mm -hmm. right? Unanimous. So why do we choose the donut over the apple? Outside of the fact that it tastes better. It tastes better. That's the obvious. Mm -hmm. Besides that, when we know it's less healthy, why don't we choose the donut over the apple? Now, I think it's two reasons. I think, number one, we don't understand the devastation that's caused by that donut. <laughs> On the cellular level, what it really does to our physiology. And secondly, we don't understand the devastation of missing that apple. That's really the, the real key issue. Um, if you eat an apple, which way does it move you on this scale? Well, and if you eat a donut, which way does it move you? No. So we have to really start thinking this in the context of everything we eat, everything we drink, everything we smoke or whatever, moves us toward sickness, disease, and early death, or it moves, moves us toward better health, better function, longer, longevity. That, that's everything we do and everything we eat. Whether we exercise or we don't exercise, whether we live in resentment or we have a sense of connection, belonging, and mattering, whether we have love for ourselves or we care about other people, all of those, those aspects of our life move us in one direction or the other. Who likes chocolate? Oh. I love chocolate. I think chocolate's probably one of the best inventions ever made. If I, I even like the dark chocolate, like the 80% stuff. I'm, I'm that crazy. Um, there was actually a study that was done in the UK. They asked women, they said, what do you prefer more, sex or chocolate? chocolate. And they all said, chocolate, because it lasts longer. Right? <laughs> well, that, that was a joke. <laughs> I like it. I've been told so many times how unfunny I am. It's ridiculous. But I can't, I can't stop trying. Um, so that chocolate, what if I was to lace that chocolate with arsenic, your favorite chocolate, whether it's Hershey's Milky Way, if I was to lace it with chocolate, 
odorless, odorless, colorless, tasteless arsenic. Would you eat it? Or would you give it to your kids? No. Of course not. Why not? Because we immediately changed your belief system about the chocolate. And that's where the problem lies, is we have a belief system that tells us that our choices really don't matter. And, oh, it's a little bit of chocolate, or, oh, it's just a donut. Maybe the donut just packs on a few extra pounds or makes the kids a little bit squirrely, but we don't associate the donut with higher rates of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and early death. And we don't associate lacking or missing that apple with significantly reduced rates of all those diseases either. So we have to start changing our belief system when it comes to our health. And this is not about doing things perfectly. That's not my goal. We don't do things perfect in my house. Perfect is unattainable. It's, it's unsustainable if you could. It's not about being perfect. It's about doing better. That's the name. 80-20. We always talk about the 80-20 rule. You heard that? It's 80% healthy and 20% American. <laughs> so you want to make sure you try to be 80-20. So the other thing is, too, is, you know, why are you guys here? So we, we've talked about, you know, like, why, why are you here? So that, the, the question is, what is your big why? Like, why do you want to get help? Why do you want to learn about nutrition? And it's not because you want more recipes or you want to learn how to shop. There's, there's something bigger and deeper underneath that than just learning more information. Because you can read a book, you can Google, you can watch YouTube. But you took time out of your day to come here and learn. So there's something bigger than just learning about food that is actually driving you to be here. So for me, that's pretty simple. My big why is I'm about to have a child. I've got a daughter who's 13. I've got another child on the way. So my big why is actually very clear. Like, I have to be healthy for that child. And I'm not like a spring chicken. Like, you know, I'm about to have a baby, right? Medicare at college graduation. Like, I've done the math. Like, uh, so I'm, I'm going to have to work out, take care of my body, and eat right, and exercise, and avoid cancer, and avoid heart disease. Like, there's a lot on my plate. And plus, I want to serve a purpose. I want to do whatever God's called me to do, and I can't do that without my health. You can't serve your purpose from a hospital bed. And I certainly don't want to be unable to get off the toilet when I'm 80. I don't want to have to stare at like a tray full of pills and be bathed by a stranger. Like I just, no desire to do that. And it's my choices today that will allow me to make better decisions, have better health later in the future. So that's the question I would ask is, is what is your big why? And it's all about our choices. It's literally everything that happens in our life. I tell my daughter, there's two cuss words in our house. And they're not the four letter ones you're probably thinking of. It's I can't. You can't say that in our house. I know I just used it. You can't say I can't in our house. That's a four letter word. Um, you can say I need help. You can say I need, I need your guidance. I'm, I'm having trouble. But you can't say I can't. And the other one is saying it's not my fault. Hmm. That's a big one. Like, oh, it's not my fault. In fact, I like to think almost everything's my fault. It's raining outside. It's my fault. You know, car, flat tire, my fault. It's pretty freeing when you start taking ownership and responsibility of about everything in your life. And some of that's tongue-in-cheek. But it's taking responsibility for where we're at and where we're going. So let's talk about nutrition. So there's some myths when it comes to nutrition. And we're going to break this down to fats, carbohydrates, and protein. Then we'll give you some examples of what to eat. But there's some myths, and then we have the truth underneath it. And I used to call these lies. I mean, they're really not myths. They're actually outright lies because we've been marketed to death to believe that our choices don't matter and to believe that, you know, fats make you fat. If you eat fat, it causes you to get fat and clogs your arteries and low fat is better, right? We've all been taught that we have low fat cookies and we have low fat yogurt and we have low fat ice cream, but we have more high fat people than we've ever had at any point in history. So it's not the fat that makes you fat. It's your body's inability to burn it that makes you fat. And if you want to burn fat, your body has to be metabolically flexible to actually use fat for fuel. And healthy fats help you burn fat. You guys ever heard that before? Mm -hmm. There's a distinction between healthy and unhealthy fats. So the truth is, there's fat fats. Those are fats that make you fat. And there's skinny fats. And I put P-H-A-T because I'm from the 90s. So fat and skinny fats. So that, those are skinny fats and there's fat fats. There's fats that kill and there's fats that heal. And there's fats that cause inflammation and there's fats that help to reverse inflammation. And there's, it's very distinctive. But if you look on the back of a label, all you're going to see is grams of fat and how many and saturated and all that garbage. But it's really the quality that matters. So the healthy fats are grass-fed meats. The health of the animal makes all the difference. 
So if the animal was healthy, then the steak is healthy. If the chicken was healthy, then the chicken breast is healthy and the egg is healthy. Does that make sense? It's all about the health of the animal, which we're going to touch on in a minute. Grass-fed butter and ghee. Anyone ever had ghee? Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, there's a few. It's usually like 2% of the room that's had ghee. Um, it's like clarified butter, so it's another, another option for butter. Avocados. I, I did this wrong. Usually I will say name healthy fats before I put this slide up here. And most people get to avocados, coconut oil, and that's all I know. <laughs> most people know like two healthy fats. <laughs> But there's lots, avocados, tree nuts, almonds, walnuts, pecans, macadamia nuts, anything that comes from a tree nut. Why not peanuts? They're legumes, right? And they grow on the ground. So they get all moldy and they're, they're highly inflammatory. Their omega-3 to 6 ratio is just atrocious. Omega-3s are the good healthy fats for a simplistic purpose. Omega-3 fats are really healthy fats. Omega-6 fats are your bad fats, like your margarine. You ever heard of, I can't believe it's not butter? Yeah. What is it? Plastic. Plastic. Yep. What? Plastic. Oh, mercy. Yeah, it's, it's petroleum. <laughs> it's essentially a, it, it's plastic. It's the simplest way mm. to put it. Terrible. Here, do the butter test when you get home. So take a scoop of, I can't believe it's not butter or margarine, and take a scoop of butter and put it on a plate and stick it outside and see what the ants will eat. The ants won't touch the margarine, but they'll devour the butter. Wow. Ants are smarter than humans because they know that the butter is better for them than the margarine is for them. Wow. Try that. Let me know how it goes. What about um, uh, fatty fish? I'm not a big fan of fatty fish. Like I like salmon, but I can't do anchovies. I can't do real heavy fatty fish, so I just do a lot of the other ones. Um, so we'll talk about tilapia, frankenfish. Just a second. Yeah. Cooking oils, you have extra virgin olive oil, flaxseed oil, sesame seed oil, avocado oil. So in general, this is a basic generalization, but at lower temperatures, you want to use olive oil or butter. If it smokes, it's rancid. So if you ever heat butter up too high, it turns it gets smoky, it turns brown, you just turn a good fat into a bad fat. Mm. The quickest way to turn a good fat to a bad fat is to heat it up too high. So butter and olive oil at low temperatures, and at higher temperatures, you could use coconut oil or grapeseed oil or avocado oil. Those are all stable at higher temperatures. But you want to what avoid... What about canola oil? Glad you said that. Do you know where canola oil comes from? No. Canola. The canola plant. Okay. Right? There's no such thing as a canola plant. <laughs> it doesn't exist. It's got a fake little ear of corn looking thing on the bottle. Uh, canola stands for Canadian Oil Low Acid. So it's an acronym for genetically modified rapeseed oil, which sounds bad enough, but it's it's essentially an omega-6, highly inflammatory, rancid by the time it reaches the grocery store shelf. But so what does the American Heart Association tell you to do? Use it, use it, use lots it. Of, so don't of. use it. Never. No. Yep. I just bought some. <laughs> <laughs> you can dispose of it properly because it's toxic, so make sure you know, the factory is placed. Take it back. You can take it back, just don't open it. Yeah. No, canola is one of those worst ones. Yeah. And that's the problem is we're told by the American Diabetic Association, the American Heart Association, mm, that this is the thing we need to be eating because it lowers our cholesterol or eat low. Do you know that, that cholesterol doesn't raise your cholesterol? What? Eating cholesterol has absolutely zero effect on your blood cholesterol. None whatsoever. Not at all. That's a myth. We're being lied to about these things. What raises your blood cholesterol is a thing called inflammation. When your body's so inflamed, it ruins the cholesterol your body's making, so your body has to make more of it. So if your LDL is high, it's because the LDL your body's making is being oxidized, it's being ruined, so your body has to make more of it to get the same job done, to transport fats to the brain, to, to, to stabilize your, your nerve sheets. So it's not, the, it's not the cholesterol, it's the sugar and the grains, which we're going to hit on. And then tropical oils, we kind of hit that already. Any questions about fats? Say it again. I'm not sure what the what the temperature range is for that. Yeah, lard is that kind of goes in the butter, so it's sort of lower temperatures. So it'd be like maybe a sauté, eggs, you know, cooked with something like that. But I wouldn't get it. Anytime you get it to smoke, it's rancid. And the worst thing you want to do is turn a good fat into a. Bad fat. Yeah, you're saying the same about not sure about calories. I'm not sure about.
always on camera, I'll get the question that I have absolutely <laughs> zero idea about the temperature flashpoint question. I'm going to look into that tonight. Grains. So Ray, tell me if you heard this slide. Grains are healthy. Mm -hmm. We've got to eat 11 whatever servings, whether it's the pyramid or that ridiculous plate thing they've come up with, like the, sad. the, yeah, the food standard of every diet, yes. sad, and so true. And guess who designed the food pyramid? The corn lobby, the wheat lobby, the dairy lobby. Mm -hmm. If there's any farmers watching, I mean, I'm not against you, but you know, the reality is our, our pyramid needs to be turned upside down where we eat more fats and more veggies and less sugars and grains and dairy. 11 servings, B vitamins, and fibers. So you got to eat all that stuff. You don't get enough grains in your diet. And here's the tricky thing with grains. It ain't just bread. Pasta, cereal, corn, crackers, chips, pretzels, cookies, bagels, muffins, pastries, oatmeal. Yes, oatmeal. Pizza. I'm sorry. Pizza's a big one. Snacks, pretzel, all that stuff. Almost anything that comes in a box bag or not a can, but a box or a bag, essentially. And the thing is, too, with grains, not only do they contain, they turn into sugar virtually immediately. So when you eat a processed grain, even like whole wheat, how quickly does that whole wheat bread turn to mush? The amylase in your saliva, the enzymes that you're lacking in your saliva, turns it to mush before it ever reaches your stomach. So it's already converted, basically converted to sugar right away. Um, by the way, too, what's higher on the glycemic index? A piece of whole wheat bread or. Is she recording that? No, I just clicked on Facebook and it was on there. Oh, I'm just glad it's working. Um, what did I say? Glycemic <laughs> index. Glycemic index. You guys know glycemic index? Yeah, like how quickly stuff turns to sugar. What's, what's higher than glycemic index? A piece of whole wheat bread or a sticker bar? Whole wheat bread. Oh, yeah. Whole wheat bread. So whole wheat bread turns to sugar quicker than a sticker bar turns to sugar. What about a piece of white bread or table sugar? Which one turns to sugar quicker? A piece of white bread or table sugar? I'd guess the white bread. White bread. Because you know where I'm going with this, uh -huh. right? White bread turns to sugar quicker than table sugar turns to sugar. Wow. Cause, yeah, because it's glucose, you know, dextrose, the, the way the scaling system is used, but mm -hmm. it all turns to sugar extremely quickly. So this myth, this lie that if we eat bread or whole wheat bread or whole grain bread. Now, is whole grain bread better than white bread? Yes. Sure. Like brown sugar is better than white sugar. Like it's a, a very, very small distinction. Grains cause a thing called inflammation, which we're going to touch on in a minute. And they contain gluten and gliadin. Those are the two sticky proteins that cause massive gut inflammation, really systemic body-wide inflammation. And then this little demonic. I like to say I coined this, but I'm sure I'm not the first one to think about this. But we call it turning off your GPS. So if you're eating G, P, and S, your GPS is set toward cancer and heart disease and allergies and arthritis and autoimmune diseases and psoriasis and ADHD and, and all, everything that you can imagine that we don't want to get in this arthritis, pulmonary diseases, Alzheimer's. Yes, Alzheimer's is linked to inflammation. It's not genetic way that we've been led to believe. Cardiovascular disease, which is about 90% preventable. Cancer, which is at least 80% preventable. Diabetes is probably 99% preventable. Neurological disease is autoimmune. So all these things are linked to inflammation. They either have at their core, or it's the main driver of the process that leads to those downstream chronic conditions. So G is grains. Remember, bread, pasta, cereal, corn, crackers, chips, pretzels, cookies, bagels, muff bagels muffins, oatmeal. Three-fourths of the grocery store. Yeah. Remember how to shop in the grocery store? Yeah, around the perimeter. Like Satan lives in the middle. And then even on the outside, you got to be careful because you got like, you know, processed dairy and you got ice cream. Well, all the your grocery is putting the bread on the outside now. Sweet. Yeah, they're getting smart. Yeah, start placing it in front of you. <laughs> processed food and processed dairy. Processed food kind of goes without saying. If you're, if you're eating out of a bag, and if you got that bag out of a window into your window in your car in a bag, it's probably not good for you. Like rarely is it going to be good. And dairy, really processed and, and denatured dairy is what we're talking about. We're not talking about raw dairy. So raw dairy that's from you know a healthy animal is actually very healthy for your body. It's really the, the processed stuff. Now mother's milk is best. Like there's nothing wrong with mother's milk, right? Like breast milk. 
But if, if mom is unavailable, or if you shouldn't live in town, the next best thing to do, that was a joke again. <laughs> fell so <laughs> It's gotta be like the delivery. It can't be the material. It's gotta be the next delivery. Time. You were too serious. Yeah. 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 It's a great visual. Raw milk is best. Has anyone ever got bought raw milk? Have you? Did you? Yeah, so if you don't own a cow, if you don't own a cow or you don't live on a farm, you gotta do like a drug deal. So you gotta like meet your you gotta meet your milk dealer or buy like one one thousandth of cow and like get cow share kind of thing. But raw milk is actually fantastic. Do you, is it, you ever not it's, it's scheming you out a little bit? Yeah, yes. All you do is pick out the dirt and the hair. Yeah. It literally it tastes just like no, right no, it tastes fantastic. It's, it's got better taste, it's more it's very low in terms of inflammation and food allergies, it's, it's raw milk's amazing. The problem is we take healthy milk from a healthy cow. And then we pasteurize it and homogenize it. Once you put you heat it up to 168 degrees, when you heat something up to 168 degrees, it's alive. What happens to it? You kill it. You kill it, right? So you kill off the good bacteria, you ruin the enzymes, you make the calcium completely unabsorbable, and then they homogenize it, which they separate it into smaller pieces, so it passes through the gut lining, it causes irritable bowel syndrome and IBS, things like that. Um, with milk, where do cows get their calcium? Grass, vegetation. They don't chase each other around the field to get their calcium, right? And why are we told to drink milk? For calcium and what else? Vitamin, vitamin D. D. You need 87 glasses of milk a day <laughs> to get your vitamin D requirement. <laughs> and that's from raw milk. That's not even from like your crummy D nature. Who's drinking 87 glasses of milk every day? I hope not. We've got bigger problems. So yeah, so we're not going to get what we need. And plus the calcium. We don't have a calcium consumption problem in the U.S. Like everybody's chugging down these calcium supplements and they want to take their VitaCal, Osteo5, whatever they're called. Taking calcium to improve your bone strength is like sitting on the couch eating protein shakes trying to get bigger biceps. Like it's not, a, it's not an intake issue. You get stronger bones by exercising and by vibrating and by doing yoga and swimming and weightlifting and running. That's how we get stronger bones. It's not from taking in, we get plenty of calcium. Everything's fortified. We're the most highly calcium fed country on the planet. We have the highest rates of osteoporosis. So it ain't about calcium, it's about what we're doing and how we're moving our bodies. And then sugar. I love sugar. Sugar's fantastic. It attaches to the same centers of the brain as the opiate co cocaine receptors, so it's no, re no wonder why we love it so much, because it's highly addictive, especially in our children. And by the way, with our kids, let's talk about that for a minute, because if people wonder, well, what about the kids? Like, there's two rules with kids. Number one is you can't ask them to do something you're not willing to do, and you can't ask them to stop doing something you're currently doing. We just, we have to be the role model. Another rule, rule, rule with kids as well is there's no kid in America that's ever starved to death because they didn't like their food choices. They eventually will eat. And we're the adults. We're the ones buying the food, preparing, doing the grocery shopping. We're the ones that have to make the better decisions. Protein. There's a big myth that we need more protein. You gotta have more protein. Everybody's gonna eat more protein. The reality is we just need enough protein. We just need enough. The amount your body needs and we, and we need it from healthy sources, either from plants or from healthy animals. And then excess protein, most people don't know this, that excess protein actually converts to sugar. Your body can only handle about 30-ish grams of protein per serving. That's for men. Most women can only handle maybe 15 to 20 grams of protein per serving. So if you're eating a nine ounce sirloin steak, you're getting 80 plus grams of protein just in that nine ounce or eight ounce filet, I mean, you get 78 grams of protein. So the 40, 30 to 40 grams that you can't use is converted to sugar. So we think more protein is better, but adequate protein is better and from healthy sources and healthy animals. So here's happy cows that are grazing, that are eating grass, they get sunshine, fresh air, probably loved on by the farmer. And then there's the ones that are kept. That's where most of our meat comes from. It's not coming from here, unless you search that out or you know the source. Most of our meat comes from basic feedlots, where they're either kept in a pen or they're kept in a small lot, where they're fed grain all day long, not grass. What happens to an animal when you feed it grain all day long? It gets fat, it gets sick. 
So he gets fat and sick. They can, they can turn a cow completely obese and essentially diabetic within six weeks. Liver tumors within six weeks. Did you notice that in order to slaughter a cow, they have to get it up onto its feet in order to do that? And there was a video not too long ago where they were like hoisting them up onto their feet with a, with a crane or with a, with a forklift just so they could get them to slaughter. I mean, it's in their recall to me. It's just it's insane. And then because they're so sick, they pump them full of antibiotics, which about 80% of our worldwide antibiotic use is in cattle or livestock. And then they have to have vaccines. So we're eating sick meat. That meat is high in omega-6s, low in omega-3s. This one is high in omega-3s and low in omega-6s. Plus has conjugated linoleic acid, arachidonic acid, so it's anti-inflammatory, pro-inflammatory. The problem is in the grocery store, because it looks the same, smells the same. This one costs $12 a pound, and this one's like $6 a pound. How do we justify that, right? If we eat food that makes us healthier, is that an investment or is that an expense? Investment. Investment. Is that just the right answer or do we believe that? Like, do we really believe that we, if we eat healthier food that costs more and is more expensive and is harder to find, that it actually moves us toward health and away from sickness, disease, and early death? Or is that just the right answer to say? That's, that's the key. Is we got to know that our choices in our food makes a, makes a difference. Chickens, and these chickens that happen to be friends with cows, <laughs> so I can imagine how much fun they have on that farm. But chickens, what are chickens supposed to eat? Worms. Grub worms, bugs. Yeah, right, they eat regular, that's food that's designed for them. These are chickens that are kept in a feedlot. Do you know what's underneath it? Uh, water? That's the tilapia pond. Uh. Do you know why they put the chicken coop over top of the tilapia farm? Oh no, don't say. Oh, yeah, they love the poop. They do. So next time you go to Captain D's, yeah. next time you get fish sticks, <laughs> next time fish you just, just you imagine you're eating chicken poop when you eat your white fish. So they literally, that's just to save time. It's economy of scale, right? You know, same way. So farm raised versus this is the farm fish. They'll actually give them like a dye. They'll dye the fish to make it look more pink, which is what wild salmon actually looks like. So farm versus wild. Which one do you think has higher omega-3s? Mm -hmm. Which one do you think has more toxins, more PCBs, more flame retardants, more plastics and phthalates? Which one has higher omega-3s and is more or less inflammatory? So it's the difference that makes all the difference. I can't overstate that. Intermittent fasting. Any questions on carbohydrates, fats, uh, or wheat? Sprouted. Sprouted. Sprouted is fantastic. Or it's better. Yeah, yeah. No, sprouted is great. You know, I would, as long as you don't have like gluten sensitivities or a lot of pre-existing autoimmune or inflammatory problems, I think, you know, a moderate amount of sprouted bread is fine. So Ezekiel bread once in a while. Ezekiel bread is great. Where do you find Ezekiel bread? In the freezer. Because they have to freeze it. Because if the bread can sit in your cabinet for two weeks without going bad, you need to be worried about that bread. Like, it should not sit in your cabinet for two weeks without going bad. That, that's, right. that's a sign something's wrong. It should have to be kept refrigerated. So, yes, those are good. Or Dames has good. So there's better options. That's the thing. And a lot of this is doing better than not doing perfect. Because a lot of this gets overwhelming. Like, where do I start? Like, I can't overhaul my entire diet overnight. So it's just making a little bit better choices over time. Can I go back to the cows? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the chicken that says it's organic, mm -hmm. can you really trust? That's a whole other question. See, that, that's what John, my husband, doesn't really believe that you can trust. Because I kept telling him, we need to buy more organic of every kind. And you're saying that's right. I found there's two kinds of people that fit that ask that question. There's people who really, truly are concerned if the chicken they're eating is full of chemicals, it is actually an organic piece of chicken. Right. Are you really worried about it? And there's other people that are like, ah, I don't want to spend the money. Well, I, I think that's what it. that's what I think he's thinking, but I that's really want it. I really want well, that's him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I really want to eat organic meat because I I I'm believing I, and this visual yeah. really makes me want to. They're held to better standards. I mean I, I believe it ninety percent. 
Okay. It's the best we got. It's the better than choice, unless you know the farmer and you met the chicken. Yeah. Like, which you know that's when is that going to happen? Yeah. Okay. Well, you can. There's a place that you can buy it. Yeah, yeah. like local organic. Yes, yeah, farmers markets and yeah. What do you think of Costco's organic? Costco's surprisingly pretty good. Yeah, they they've impressed me lately. Okay. With some other choices. That's good to know. Yeah. The okay. problem is if you go out to eat, that's the problem. Right. You go to Jay Alexander's, you go to McDonald's, right. you don't same know. truck pulls up behind both restaurants. Yeah. Kind of the same mm -hmm. source, sadly. Like you're paying three times more, but it's kind of the same meat. Okay. For the most part. Thank um, you. Yeah, you're welcome. That's a great question. The problem is like in the grocery store, it's like even with like apples. Like you get the organic apple, or the non-organic apple, it's big and fat and shiny and juicy and you get the organic apple and it looks like it's been kicked down the grocery aisle that's bruised and like half the size that's twice the price, right? So again, yeah. investment or expense. But for most people, they'll notice if they'll make this, if you make the switch toward organic, which should you change first, your meat, and, your meat or your veggies? I think your meat. Your veggies. That's what most people say. You always switch your animal products first. Okay. And people say, well, why? Well, because an animal bioaccumulates toxins over its lifespan. So if you eat a tomato that's not organic, that's been sprayed a time or two, a month, month long, so it accumulates only so many toxins. Where you have a cow that's been abused or fed corn and antibiotics and grain for years and years and years, or months and months, and it bioaccumulates all those toxins in its meat. Mm. So we always want to switch our meat and dairy products first before we switch our veggies. It's just about um, amount of exposure. Like eating little fish over big fish. Correct. The big fish have lived a long time and yep. accumulate. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. So mm -hmm. eat fish, smaller fish are always better because the bigger fish eat the smaller fish. <laughs> and shellfish, let's talk about that. Why are shellfish? And I love lobster and I love bottom feeders. They're shrimp. bottom feeders, yeah. Right. So they eat the poop of the yeah. fish that swim above them and drop down. So they're literally eating, they're bioaccumulating the mercury and the PCBs and all the waste products from the fish that land on the floor. They're eating and bioaccumulating all those. So just don't eat them, right? Yeah, unless it's super Or 80-20. <laughs> 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 Rarely. Yeah, it's in moderate. 80-20, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, intermittent fasting. So intermittent fasting. Raise your hand if you tried intermittent fasting. It's amazing. I've done it for probably five or six, four or five years now. And I really can't imagine going back. So the gist of it, there's multiple ways to do intermittent fasting. You can fast for a whole day. You can do a 12-hour. I do a 16-hour off and an 8-hour on. So you eat all your food in an 8-hour window. That's, that's the simplistic way to do it. So I basically eat my lunch. Like I had lunch, breakfast, whatever you want to call it, today at 1 o'clock. That was my first meal. And I'll have my last meal probably around 8 o'clock. Maybe you have another snack because I got another hour, so I'll probably stretch that to about nine. So that's an eight hour window, and then you fast from 9 p.m. till about noon or 12 or 1 o'clock the next day. So it's a 16 hour fast. And the physiology behind that is your body, when we eat a meal, it first goes to the liver. It refills the liver with sugar and glycogen, and whatever can't be stored in the liver dumps into the bloodstream and gets stored as fat, right? So when you go through the night and you're not eating, then your body's using whatever's floating in the bloodstream first, and then it drains the liver, and then it goes searching for fat to, to feed. So you're encouraging the body to use fat for fuel. Mm. But most people aren't very biologic or metabolically flexible. Their body only likes to use sugar for fuel and can't effectively use fat for fuel. So they get about eight hours into their fast, and they start dying, like ravish, like what am I going to eat? Because their body's starving. It can't use fat for fuel. But with consistent use of intermittent fasting, your body becomes flexible. It can use sugar when it wants to use sugar, and it can use fat when it wants to use fat, right? But we have to starve it of sugar for a time in order to get it to learn to use fat for fuel. Hunter-gatherers didn't have three square meals a day with snacks in between. Like, we didn't, when we were a caveman, we didn't wake up and have pancake breakfast, right? We didn't have Subway for lunch and pizza for dinner. Like, we had to have periods of time or our bodies use fat for fuel, and that's the key. Okay, so what's the deal with not eating past six o'clock or eight o'clock? Because some people say that's how you can fast that way, 
Yeah, that, if you're still going to do breakfast in the morning, I think it's still better, like you said, to not eat your dinner past. You don't want to eat enough calories to run the Boston Marathon and then go to sleep. Right. Right? Like, so if you're going to still do three meals a day, it's better to shut that off as early as you can. The wider you can make that window, the better. So some people start with like a 10 hour fast and then a 12 hour fast and 14 kind of work their way out to a 16 hour fast. And the trick with this, this is the key if you want it to work right, is the first meal you eat when you break your fast, no GPS, no grains, no processed dairy, no processed food, no sugar. Because otherwise it's gonna kick you out of ketosis and you're gonna quit burning fat and you're gonna start using sugar again for fuel. See you guys. Um, so that's the trick. After your fast, you want to kind of stay in ketosis as long as you can. So meat and veggies, you want to eat salad, you want to eat nuts, seeds, like whatever you got to, like real healthy, real food, like the way it looks when God made it. Right? Yeah. yeah. Not in a box bag or a can, to the degree that you can. So intermittent fasting, the, the effects and the benefits are almost too many to list, but in the blood, it increases insulin and IGF-1 decreases leptin, which is the hunger hormone that tells us to, to burn fat. So leptin is the hormone that tells your body to burn fat, burn fat, burn fat. But we burnt our leptin receptors, we fried our leptin receptors to the point that your body can't hear that signal of burn fat. So your body has no capacity to, to trigger itself to burn fat. Uh, ghrelin is the hunger hormone. That's why people just get so hungry or they eat 17 more bites than they, they know their body needed. It's because mm -hmm. of that ghrelin imbalance. So Increase. How, how long does it take after you burn all this out to recover from this so your body understands the signals? Like how many days, weeks of intermittent fasting does it take? Or to, just removing GPS out of your diet, mm -hmm. going into moderate intermittent fasting. How long does it take for your body to regenerate itself to understand that it needs to listen and talk? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> it depends on the person. Yeah, I mean, if you're dealing with someone, it depends how metabolically inflexible you are to start with. There's no way to test for it, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, you can get your leptin levels tested. For most people, by the end of the first week, they're starting to notice a real, real difference. And we have a ChiroThin program. It's like a six-week weight loss program that really shortens the curve on that. Kind of tells you exactly. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Most people, it's about a week to two weeks. Okay, I literally. Cleaned out GPS. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing that now for almost two weeks. Mm -hmm. And on, like, next week, he wants me to start bringing in IF. Mm -hmm. But you know, I don't eat anything like that. I usually stop eating around 6, 6 30. I go do my workout in the mornings. Mm -hmm. Then I have a bowl of coffee, you know, nine o'clock yeah. in the morning, yeah. a little bit of protein, a little bit of oil, MCT oil, in my coffee. Yeah, then you'll and be it's like I'm not hungry for like two o'clock. Yeah, you're you're eighty percent of the way there. If the problem I'm is, trying to learn, so. Yeah, no, no, your 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 transition will be easy. It's when people have to have waffles and eggos and bowls of cereal every morning, or they're just but hunger gets them out of bed in the morning. Mm. For some of those people, it's a little tougher to it takes a little bit longer. But everybody within a week to two weeks, they're pretty much on track. Um, reduce energy. Reduces cell proliferation in the intestines. What does that sound like? Colon cancer. Because cancer is abnormal cell pro proliferation. Say that one 10 times fast. So decreased risk of colon cancer. And you'll see a commonality between all these. Reducing inflammation, reducing inflammation, reducing inflammation, reducing inflammation. So it's the, the main effect of intermittent fasting is it reduces inflammation. Wow. So remember what diseases are linked to inflammation? Name a disease. Everything. Right. Yeah. It's almost everything is connected to inflammation. So that's, that's the key. Highly, highly, highly encourage you guys to do this. It's, it's one of the best things I've ever done. And I cannot imagine going back. And I'm not even hungry. Like by the time I eat at 1 o'clock, I'm just kind of eating. A lot of times just eating because it's time to eat. You don't eat at 11? You eat at 1 for the first time? Well, I don't get out of office hours till about 11.30. So by the time I get home, it's 12.30ish for the first meal. But 11 would work. Yeah, whatever your 16, even like if people your work 16 nights, hours. Yeah, okay. if people work second shift, whatever your 16 hours. I just like that schedule because I sleep through seven hours of it. 
-hmm. and then I go to the gym. And the other thing too is when you when you fasted for about eight hours and you go work out, you're burning fat at such an accelerated rate because there's no sugar in the system. So to get you through your workout, your body's got to use fat for fuel to get you through your workout. And you're counting coffee too. I love coffee. No, you're counting that morning coffee has to wait until. No. You can have coffee. coffee gets me out of bed. Okay. No well, sugar, I, no I, That's what I wanted. No, black no. coffee. Yeah, no. Coffee's yeah. good. Okay. And we, we drink a little bit healthier coffee, but yeah, I'll use like stevia. That's what I, I then, use. Mm -hmm. Stuff in it. Yeah, just like we say is that, you know, I used to cycle a lot, and I used to plan you know, 80 to 90, 100 grams of carbs per hour <laughs> just to maintain the speed and all that. Mm -hmm. And we switched to this. <laughs> Oh, we've been lying to. We've been brainwashed. And I've been doing between eight and twelve hours of riding a week, and I haven't had a craving on a bike. Yeah. And mm. Usually by the tenth day of it, in a row, mm -hmm. I now hit fatigue. Sure. Mm -hmm. you know, Which you before it was like three days into it, I was like, I'm done. Yep. So I mean, I've seen a difference now. And your body preferentially prefers fat to fuel. Mm -hmm. You would rather use ketones or fat for fuel, especially your brain, versus sugar or grain. A chiro thing, I'm not going to spend much time on this. We have a six-week program. It's a doctor-supervised weight loss program where we give you the exact, you take these drops and this one supplement that helps to mobilize fatty acids. It curves your blood sugar. It makes the transition super, super easy. Um, but it's uh, a six-week program. You have a weight loss instruction book. We have all your, it's a 60-page recipe book. The recipes are amazing. But it's basically intermittent fasting with a lower, call, lower calorie diet. So like protein, veggies, and fruits. We have uh, we started the program about five weeks ago in the office. I've got one guy that's lost 38 pounds. I talked to the guy the other day, he's lost 29 pounds. A lady who's lost over 22 pounds. Another guy that's, I mean, it's just, most people lose, most women lose about 22-ish pounds in six weeks, and then most men lose 35, because kind of a man's world that comes with weight loss. <laughs> that's why you guys are the stronger gender, right? That's right. Um, yeah, so it's pretty, and it locks the weight in. It's not a quick fix, like I'm going to lose it and gain it all back two weeks later. We teach you how to lock that weight in, so it changes your basal metabolic rate, and it, and it raises your BMR, and, and also your, um, essentially resetting your metabolism. Weight Watchers, to lose 20 pounds, costs over 300 bucks for 12 weeks. Power within 1,500, but we're doing it half off, so if you're curious about that, do your system. To lose, it takes 12 weeks to talk about 1500 bucks. And Jenny Craig, 15, 20 weeks. All these systems that use these artificial garbage packaged food that you got to keep eating. I just, that's why I never did weight loss programs in the, in the past. So it's basically 1599 if you want to do it, half price until February 15th. Ask Dr. Devins or Maddie, and they can kind of get you squared away with that. And then I want to bring up Miss Jackie. She kind of tells us about juice. I will tell you all about it. talking about nutrition, so I want to bring some resources that are my favorite, and I am a self-proclaimed health nut myself. you got to get it on camera. I'm coming. Yeah. I'm the manager <laughs> at Clean Juice, and um, I think Clean Juice just does a really fantastic job of being very nutrient-dense, so a lot of what we talked about here is what we practice over there, like if there's, we only use maple syrup or honey as a sweetener, and it's disclosed where it's used, and that sort of thing. Our salads, I feel like food really needs, you were talking about why we're not eating healthy, it like needs to be convenient. So you really, in my house, we try to shop on Fridays, so we're ready for the weekend, and then hit the Monday rolling, we have our meals planned, we're successful when we do that. When we don't do that, it's like, oh, let's go get pizza, what do the kids want, you know, and then you, you gotta plan. And if you can't plan, then where do you go to pick up something healthy? I mean, there's not that many places. I'm, I'm very picky. And really don't even like to go out because of tilapia and all that other stuff. So um, our salads are phenomenal and we use a lot of plant protein. So we put quinoa on there. We have walnuts on a salad. Uh, you could opt for the feta cheese or let it go if you wanted to avoid the dairy, which I do. Um, so it's great to get different forms of protein. We have avocado, healthy fats. We have coconut oil that we put in smoothies. So we've you can doctor it up, and if you want to be a real health nut, you can just talk to any of us and we can, you know, 
and they're all customizable. Yes. The acai bowls are amazing. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about water also. It's really important to drink enough water each day. I, my rule of thumb is half of your body weight in ounces is how much water you want to take in. Defiance Fuel is an amazing water. It is molecularly structured to hydrate all of your cells evenly. And so I find like if I work out, I don't want to drink water because it's like glorpy and it just makes me feel like heavy or something. But this water like goes, I feel like it goes into my cells and hydrates me as opposed to like hanging around in my belly. So it's, it's fantastic. pH balance. Yes, it's alkaline water as well, so it helps reduce inflammation um, and just flushes you out. Like this, this is a very special water, like for detoxing and that sort of thing. It just helps with that process. So up your water. You know, if you're buying bottled water, opt for a good water. You know, a lot of waters are just purified tap water, so so pay attention. Um, a few of my Resources I wanted to share. Um, I've done most, I love the Mediterranean diet. Um, we were talking about the food system. Um, Michael Pollan, he is a fantastic, you are, I think you would love his writing because he writes so much about the food system and the cows and all the things we talked about that are wrong with society. So he is fantastic. And then uh, Joel Furman, he really kind of promotes like a plant based diet. Like he's a little more on the vegan side, but you know like the 80-20, like most cultures around the world use meat as an accent. We're like a culture where meat at every single meal. So I love is, vegans. I, I eat all the time. <laughs> I'm not a vegan, but I did try a vegan diet, and it just made me upset and bitter. And I couldn't have the things I wanted. But um, uh, Mark Bittner, he proposes vegan before six, and I think that's kind of cool because it helps you avoid meat throughout the day. And then you just eat what you want at six o'clock. So, but anyway, Joel Furman, he is fantastic. Each chapter begins with a case study about a person that is extremely sick, and so he just with food gets them off all of their medicine. So, fantastic. If you want to know anything about these titles, I'll leave them over there. And that's pretty much. And then clean juice. We're all organic. We are here to make things convenient, and our juice is not pasteurized. So if you go in the grocery store, those juices and cleanses and things you see are pasteurized, the enzymes are dead. It's dead juice, so we have a lot of juice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So come see us, and it's and delicious. And you have like three and four or five day food juice cleanses? Yeah, we have cleanses. Those are like a, like a circuit breaker to help you get back on track, help or detox if you want to detox. Pregnant women, I tell them, you're going to the hospital, you're going to have a baby, you're going to have trouble eating and taking care of yourself or if you're nursing, take a six pack of juice, it'll help you rebound and those vitamins go right in your bloodstream and then if you're nursing, right to the baby. you get those vitamins right away. So. Yeah, juicing is so important because the, the soil that we grow most crops in are, are completely depleted. Mm -hmm. So a bowl of spinach that our grandparents used to eat, we need at least 15 bowls of that same spinach to get the same nutrient so juicing is a way to sort of c compact and get a higher dose of all those essential nutrients. Mm -hmm. That's what people use our juices. Predominantly, they come in and just supplement with them versus cleansing. You know, cleansing is a more specific strategy. Thank you. For Thank that. you. And yeah. take some juice on the way out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we got one last little section here. So this is kind of like where health comes from. Just last little quick to wrap up. So um, where, what, which organ controls health? Your... And if you're a current chiropractic patient, you have better know. Mm -hmm. Organ, which organ controls your health? Your heart? Your liver. Everybody lower. says that. That's the most common answer. It's not right. They used to gauge whether you were alive or dead by whether your heart was beating. Right? So if your heart stopped beating, they thought you were dead. Well, then they realized, like, you have to be brain dead because your heart, we can re-jumpstart your heart, right? But if your brain dies, there's no re-jumpstart of your brain. So your brain is the organ that controls all of your health. Okay. It's actually the first organ that forms inside, inside your mother's womb, too, yeah, right? So the right. brain forms first, and then the spinal cord, and then all the little nerves, and then the organ cells, and everything mm. grows off of that, right? Right. So your nervous system controls all health and function, 
And the, the, the definition of the word health is actually inside the word healing. Because how you heal and how you function is determined term, how healthy you are. So the saying goes like this. You can go a month without food. Like we've all seen Survivor, right? Those people still alive after a month. And you can go days without water. And the way you can judge how important something is to your body is how long you could go without it. So you can go a, a month with no food. So water is actually more important to your body than food. Because you can't go as long without it. You can go minutes without air. So we're going to hold our breath and breathe. So air is more important than water, which is more important than food. This is basic baseline physiology. And there's something you can't go one second without nerve supply. If I cut your head off, how quickly are you dead? <laughs> Immediately. Dead. Could you heal a cut on your hand if I cut your head off? No, no right? A sprained ankle or a cold. So your brain has to send messages down the spinal cord and then out your nerves to all your organ cells and tissues. And this is essentially how... It's not going to fall, is it? Hope not. Hope not to. It did before. That's going to fall. The spine broke. That's true. So your brain, <laughs> that's for sure. Your brain sits inside your skull, <laughs> sends messages or electricity down the spinal cord and then out these little nerves. So the nerves at the top of the neck go to basically everywhere you don't have to think about. The brain stem. Breathing, heart rate, digestion. Your vagus nerve exits from the top of the neck. So everything you don't have to consciously think about is controlled by the top of the neck. Remember Christopher Reeve, Superman? Remember how he got injured? Mm -hmm. Fell off the horse, mm -hmm. right? He, he, he chin planted. So when he went down, he mm -hmm. kind of did like that number there. And the top bone in his neck bumped up against the spinal cord. He had a bruise on the top of his spinal cord. You could have covered it with your pinky. So the extent of his injury was a bruise on the top part of the spinal cord. Mm. But what did it affect in his body? Yeah, Everything. Like he couldn't breathe, he had a respirator to breathe, he had a pacemaker to keep his heart beating, he had to push on his bowels to make his bowels move, all because his brain wasn't able to tell his body how to function right. So if you look at the next slide, this is definitely going to fall. The way we're wired is the nerves in the top part of the neck go to the eyes, ears, nose, and throat, and the thyroid. If you get a little further down the back, they go to the heart and the lungs and the stomach. And then down the lowest part of the back, they go to the digestive organs and reproductive organs. When we look at the body, if we look at the way we're designed, the, the, the armor around the nervous system is the spinal cord or the spinal column and the skull. If I was to smash in someone's skull and, and the, the bones of the skull were pushing into the brain, how What's the likelihood that person's brain could heal unless we remove those segments off the brain tissue? Like you would have to. You have to remove the pressure. When the spine moves out of position, the nerves that come out of the spine can get compressed, get irritated, get, get interfered with. And if that nerve is going to your stomach, what's happening to the stomach? If the nerve is going to the heart, if I cut the nerve to the heart, what would happen to the heart? Stop. Stop beating, right? Well, instead of cutting the nerve to the heart, what if you put pinching pressure on the nerve and you left it there for... 20 or 30 years. What's slowly happening to the heart? And a lot of people do say, well, how does the spine get out of alignment from car wrecks, from childhood injuries? Who's had a car wreck in the room? Mm -hmm. Right, it's almost like everybody, which is, we think, mm -hmm. oh, it's just a car wreck. We're not supposed to have car wrecks. Right? Our bodies weren't designed mm -hmm. to hit another vehicle at high speeds, right? Mm -hmm. There were no chairs in the Garden of Eden, right? We weren't supposed to sit at a desk and stare at computers or slip and fall on the ice or even walk around in shoes on concrete. We're designed to walk in on bare feet in grass or on dirt, right? So we do tons of things to our body that moves the spine out of position and affects the way the nerves function. Now only 6% of the nerve detects pain. So a teeny tiny part of that nerve is actually designed to tell you that you are in pain. A small, small piece. The rest of it is either controlling your limbs or your muscles or the, or the vital organs. So the job of a chiropractor is not to get rid of your neck pain. If your neck pain gets better, fantastic, but that's not what we're doing. It's not to, to make your low back feel better, although if your low back gets better, fantastic. The goal is to restore the normal alignment so it allows the brain to tell the body how to function properly. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But a lot of people use chiropractic just for pain. It's like having a smartphone that we only use to call 911. Mm -hmm. Like it'll, it'll do that, but it's capable of so much more. So in our office, we get tons of people that come in initially. Usually they'll come in for symptoms, which, by the way, when you look at symptoms, here's a list. And these are the most common ones that we see. 
allergies, headaches, menstrual problems, high blood pressure, depression, insomnia, sciatica, carpal tunnel. Those are just those are essentially like smoke detectors in the house or oil light in the car. They're 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 not the problem. They're a problem, but they're not the problem. It's your body's way of telling you that something's out of balance or something's not working right. And the problem is when you go to the doctor for allergies, the traditional medical system, or headaches, or high blood pressure, or depression, what do they give you? Pill. A pill. Yeah. Every time. And not to say that drugs have no value, some pills work sometimes for some things, but most pills are designed to treat symptoms. It's like taking duct tape and putting it over the oil line, right? So if I cover up your headaches, which is the nerve to the head, it's your body's way of telling you that something's out of balance, if I take, take duct tape and put it over the oil light with the drug, what's happening to the underlying condition? It's getting worse and worse all over time. So that's really the name of the game. We're not really treating symptoms, although that's why a lot of people come in. The goal is to get the body healthy. And it's based on four principles. Number one is the body is self-healing. That's, that's just a fact. If you cut your finger with a paper cut, it heals itself. You don't have to have you know, a knee score. You don't have to have a band-aid. Your body heals itself. That, that's a fact. The other principle is that the nervous system controls all aspects, all aspects of health and human experience, including your life. Is that a belief or a fact? I believe. That's a fact. You cut off your head, your, your, your human experience diminishes, right? And then interference to the nervous system sabotages health and life. Then our job, very simply, is to remove interference. I just want you guys to leave with that, that principle and that knowledge that this is not just about back pain, it's about keeping our bodies healthy. And it's about taking personal responsibility. Like our health is our greatest asset. Without our health, everything else kind of goes downhill. Mm -hmm. Your finances go downhill, your marriages, your relationships. If we don't have our health, we don't have anything. So, okay. all right, guys. Take a little bit of Q&A if you want. Otherwise, we can wrap it up. And God bless. Thank you. Thank you.